Well, God has called us to be about the transformation of lives and communities by building bridges to Jesus Christ. And today we wrap up this uh, We Build Bridges Generosity series. And today I want to talk about um, another transformational value that, that we sense God calling us to focus on in 2019. A couple of Sundays ago, we talked about the transformational value of healthy friendships. And I came across this, this, uh, this by John Ortberg. He says this, Never worry alone. When anxiety grabs my mind, it is self-perpetuating. Worrisome thoughts reproduce faster than rabbits. So one of the most powerful ways to stop the spiral of worry is simply to disclose my worry to a friend. The simple act of reassurance from another human being becomes a tool of the Spirit to cast out fear. Because peace and fear are both contagious. We need healthy spiritual friendships. A transma the transformational value that I want to talk about today is living out an authentic faith. Living out an authentic faith. What is an authentic faith? We talk about faith all the time in the church, but I think sometimes we just start talking about it. And I think there are times when we really need to dig down and, 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 and try to define again what an authentic faith is. The foundation of our faith is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And in Christ, God demonstrates to us two things. First of all, God demonstrates his love. He sent his son Christ to die for us and for our sins. And in Christ, we see God's love. And also in Christ, secondly, we see God's power. That the third day after his death, God brought Christ back to life. It's the foundation of our faith. Jim Cimbala, in talking about the cross and the resurrection, says this, The cross, as poignant as it is, is understandable from a human perspective. An innocent man was murdered by crooked politicians and religious leaders. But the empty tomb, what can we say? Only a supernatural God could accomplish that. And Easter easily becomes bunnies and eggs and new outfits. And I fear sometimes the supernatural fades into myth and legend. Some days I feel we've lost the power. Some days I feel I've lost that power. Some days, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever comes out of my mouth and I don't even realize it. And the essence of my faith shifts from the moving, restoring, transforming, redeeming, leading, convicting, and consecrating supernatural power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that brought a dead man back to life to I'm a Christian so I should do something good today. Brendan Manning writes, and if you've never read the Ragamuffin Gospel by Brendan Manning, I would recommend it highly. He writes, I have been seized by the power of a great affection. Remember back in the day when we United, United Methodists drove around with, with bumper stickers that said, Catch the Spirit? You remember that? That was a long time ago, wasn't it? You know, I always wondered as a kid, uh, because I was a kid when that was around, I always wondered, shouldn't it be caught by the Spirit? I mean, who's active in faith first? And what does an authentic faith look like? We have a great witness of an authentic faith amongst the believers in Thessalonica. And in 1 Thessalonians, we see the origins and the essence of their faith and how they lived it out. And, and I, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to be in the first chapter, starting in the second verse 
Uh, and, and again, we're going to move through Scripture, and it'll be very handy for you to have it in front of you. There are pew Bibles, and I know you have them on your phones. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you need the table of contents, there's no shame in that. Paul says this in the second verse. I always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We always thank God for you and continually mention you in our prayers. Paul and Silas and Timothy had all preached in Thessalonica and some people had responded, but now they are being persecuted and harassed for their newfound faith. Now listen carefully to Paul's thanksgiving. We always thank God for all of you. Paul doesn't thank them for their response, but gives thanks to God. And this is partially because of the difference in our culture and the ancient Mediterranean culture. When you said thank you to someone in the Hellenistic world is a way of, of kind of settling a matter, of paying a debt, or of ending a relationship. So Paul doesn't say thanks to them, but to God for them. And there's also some, some good theology that Paul is sharing here. Paul didn't consider coming to faith a matter of a human initiative or achievement. It was God's initiative. I mean, the Thessalonians were not religious seekers who finally found what they were looking for in this newfound religion that Paul presents to them. Just as Paul had not been seeking a deeper religious experience when he was miraculously transformed on the Damascus Road by the risen Christ. In each case, it was a matter of God's initiative and call, not human seeking first. And I believe that's still the case today for you and for me. An authentic faith, an authentic faith begins with the miraculous moving of the Spirit of God in our lives. Paul then continues in the third verse. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Paul is doing here, he's not listing Christian virtues or values. And the faith of which he speaks here is not an attitude, but the God-given power to do transformational Christian work. And the love that he speaks of is not an emotion and hope is not merely optimism. It wasn't just them trying to be spiritual with faith, hope, and love and it wasn't solely their human work, labor, and endurance. In an authentic faith, it's the relationship between all of these things. Because faith Hope and love aren't enough. And neither are works, labor, and endurance. Work, working by themselves, they do not have the power to bring about life and community transformation. Rather, Paul is thankful for their faith that did something. It was a faith that welled up. And a faith that produced work. And he was thankful for their love. That their love wasn't barren or an end in and of itself. And their love that wasn't, it, it wasn't an emotional thing. That their love was active. And it prompted labor. We've all heard the saying, a labor of love, right? That's what Paul's talking about here. It's not a passive Dormant love is a love that does something. It labors. And we know how Paul paints love. 
1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envious. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. This is what we know about this type of love, because all of us, have, as, good, as good Christians, we have tried to love our neighbor as ourselves, and this is what we know. It's impossible to love in this way we don't have it in us this is a supernatural love that paul talks about a love that gets in us when we've been seized by the power of a great affection just like paul paul is on the way to damascus to kill christians and he sees by an unimaginable love, and it changed him forever. And just like the Thessalonians, and just like everyone who has been infected by an authentic faith, there's something in them that's, that is not of them and is greater in them. It's something that has come and taken up residence in them. And they do things that they, cannot, they could not do on their own. And I long for more of that, don't you? And finally, Paul is thankful for their endurance. Because the endurance that he's, he's thankful for isn't just a gritting it out, hanging on endurance, something that had to be manufactured in themselves. This endurance that Paul is thankful for had an origin. It had a beginning. It was an inspired endurance. And it was inspired by hope in the love of God demonstrated on the cross of Jesus Christ and God's power that brought a dead man back to life. And the word for labor used here is often had a distinctive Christian connotation of spreading the gospel and making disciples. And what does hope in our Lord Jesus Christ look like? Verse 4, Paul says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God that he has chosen... Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. How is it evident that God had called them? Because it was obvious that the gospel that came to them, not simply by words, but with the power of the Holy Spirit that caused the deep conviction. Supernatural things were happening actually in that whole region because of them. And the gospel that Paul speaks of, he speaks of, as he does in 1 Corinthians 15. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. And after that, he appeared more to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared also to me as one abnormally born. The gospel Paul is referring to here is the grace of Filled, undeserved labor of love that God demonstrated while we were yet sinners in the death, burial, resurrection, and appearance of Christ. And he says in verse 6, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit. But even with supernatural power, they were not immune to suffering. And the power was evident that even in suffering, they could still have joy 
which was given by the Holy Spirit. It's an authentic faith. Verse 8, the Lord's message rang out from you, not only to Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not have to say anything about it. It rang out. It reverberated. The Thessalonians' faith-produced work, their labors of love, and their hope-inspired endurance had been like a rock thrown into a calm pond, and the ripples of their influence had been far-reaching. Macedonia was like saying, listen, I, can, I, I have come here to Gainesville first, and your influence has been experienced throughout the southeast. In Achaia, Paul saying, listen, I was down in Achaia. It's about 350 miles south of Thessalonica. I was 350 miles away, and I heard about you and about your faith. And Paul's saying, and listen, and it's not only in Macedonia, and it's not only Achaia, but it's everywhere. The Thessalonians were truly transforming lives and communities by building bridges to a crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. And do you know where the preacher is in all of this time? Paul is writing this letter from Corinth, hundreds of miles away. The shepherd of the flock wasn't even there. It reminds me of a quote that I love by Fors Matonga. Shepherds don't reproduce sheep. Sheep reproduce sheep. The supernaturally spirit-filled church folk are working by faith and laboring in love and enduring in hope and those around them are being seized by a great affection by the spirit and their lives are being radically transformed. Paul saying, listen, everywhere I've been I haven't had to talk about Christ because folks have already heard. And I trace it back to the source. And you were at the epicenter. Wouldn't you love for folks to say that about Gainesville First United Methodist Church? Listen, I kind of showed up in this community and I followed the path of grace in this community and I pulled in your driveway. And Paul ends with his, his, his summary statement of faith. Two stanzas, three lines. Verse 9. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven who he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The first line refers to the past, the second to the present, and the third to the future. You turn from idol gods. That's what you did in the past. That was the beginning of this. To serve the living and true God, the present, and to wait for his son from heaven, the future, whom he raised from the dead, past, Jesus who rescues us, present, from the coming wrath, future. And it summarizes the Christian experience. We turn, we serve, and we wait. We turn, we serve, and we wait, which corresponds to Paul's faith, hope, and love. We are transformed by an authentic faith, which saves us rather than our works. And the power that invaded us doesn't stay in us. It transforms everything around us. How is your faith? How are things, church, with your soul? Where are you in all of this? And what are you trying to do with this breath that still is in your lungs? Thomas Merton said, if, if you want to identify me, ask me not where I live, 
or what I like or how I comb my hair. But ask me what I think I'm living for in detail. And ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully for the thing I want to live for. Between these two answers, you can determine the identity of any person. Eugene Peterson said, one way to define spiritual life is getting so tired and fed up with yourself. You go on to something better, which is following Jesus. It's appropriate that today is the 501st anniversary of the Reformation, the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg. And Martin Luther had an incredible impact on John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, and on John Wesley's heartwarming experience. His writing, Martin Luther's writing was A catalyst for Wesley's May 24th, 1738 experience. Wesley recounts it this way. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Martin Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance would give, was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. An authentic faith. God loves us, God is with us, God is coming back for us, and in the meantime, God has our best interests in mind, and he can be trusted. That's the foundation of our faith. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, uh, we confess that we make it about so many things that it isn't. And the truth is, when we're honest, that we see we make it about things that we can be in control of. And the things that we can continue to be the decision makers. And the more we bring it to ourselves, the, the, the less power there is to do great things. And Lord, I pray for great things. I pray for this, this church to rise up. And to do miraculous things in this community, in the world, and in our own lives, Jesus, that you would come and reside in us in maybe ways never before. That lives would truly be transformed, not just made better. Not just made easier, transformed. And a community wouldn't just be a nicer place to live, a safer place to live, a place free of poverty and pain, but a place that is transformed into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And all would know it. All would know it. We give you thanks, God, that you initiate this action in us. And our prayer is simply, come, Lord Jesus. We long for you.